process preparation and performance. I'm Bill, this is JR, and we are extremely stoked to have Stephen Prather of Sports Source Analytics with us. 2011, the business started. It's gone remarkable places. It is a huge name in college football and college athletics, as you're about to find out. I've told you before, JR and I are geeks. We're a bunch of data nerds. We sit up at midnight, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning, talking, texting, trying to figure out any analytical advantage we can whenever we're playing somebody. Because if you're like us, we're not always blessed with the biggest and fastest and strongest people. But we feel like we can make you better athletically. But what we can do is teach you the game. And today, Mr. Prather is here to help us learn why analytics should not only be at the forefront of your mind with thinking, but why you can't live without it. Welcome, Mr. Prather. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Excited. Absolutely. JR, how excited are you right now? Oh, I'm, I'm like trip to Disneyland time right now. So I just won the Super Bowl. Super excited. <laughs> for, for those of you that have listened to a few of the other episodes, JR is like uh, a genius with Excel. He helped and developed really did it by himself he created the program the r code so many other things that we've used year in and year out and jr because this is like uh, your birthday today kick this thing off and let's learn some more about analytics yeah i'm super excited for this to hear what uh mr prather has to say and i'm gonna start off with the first question here which will be how did you guys get started yeah so it's kind of a fun story this was a fake business plan that I put together in business school. I had no intention of this being an actual business. Uh, this was 2000, 2005. I was, uh, I'd go, I, I did my undergrad at Vanderbilt, went and worked in, I played baseball at Vanderbilt. And you know, so I've got the little bit of the numbers background from kind of being a baseball guy. Like most people, I read Moneyball and just loved the book mm -hmm. and you know, love what sure. it stood for and just the way, you know, the way you approach thinking. And um, it went back to Vanderbilt to get my MBA. And then uh, we had to do a communications course, which is basically just how to present a business plan. So I put together this kind of fake plan. And I've always loved college football from the standpoint of a spectator and that, you know, just always been a passion of mine. Even though I was a baseball player, I've always loved that. So I basically put together the plan of, hey, you know, I'd love to kind of start a company that helps athletic directors hire coaches but do it with really good information like actually dig in so instead of just saying hey this guy interviewed well i like the way he looks like let's actually dig in let's create a database where you have all this credible information on coaches and see how well they perform and how dependent they might be on coordinators and all these things so i did that and um did it for the class you know and and did, really did not think about it again i mean i i did it for the class Put it aside. I think I like I sent it to my brother and was like, "Hey, I thought you might find this interesting." Because my brother played baseball and was a sport junkie like myself. So fast forward, I, I graduate in '07, got my MBA, started working in commercial real estate here in Nashville. Market basically collapses in '08. So yes, I'm sitting here. Did. I'm a commission sales guy, and I'm brand new. And I'm like, you know what? I might need an extra, you know, it's extra money somehow. <laughs> my brother. Right was doing commercial real estate in Atlanta and kind of having the same experience. And he called me up one, one day and says, Hey, um, what, do you remember that business plan you put together? I was like, what business plan? And he like resent it to me. I literally forgotten about it. And he's like, <laughs> like, you think we could actually do this? I'm like, dude, I don't, I mean, I, I have like basic Excel skills and I'm like, yeah, I've got good ideas. And then just, you know, how much I, I think um, Jim Collins calls it who luck. You know, a lot of life is who you interact with and who you introduce to. So mm -hmm. one of my best friends from college who played baseball with me had moved to Atlanta right after school and also become very close to him. My brother is arguably the smartest guy on earth. And, <laughs> and he literally, the, I mean, he has incredible coding skills. So we call him up and we're like, hey, do you think we could ever create a database like this? He's like, look, I'm actually looking for some side projects. So long story short, we kind of started, you know, building this debt. This was probably in you know, 09, you know, late 09. And we basically spent a year or so kind of putting the database together and kind of officially launched right around 2011. 
and the kind of rest has been history. So it's, that's kind of the, the story of fake business plans, what started this thing off. <laughs> that's incredible. So, so I got to ask, what grade did you get on it? Yeah, it's a good question. I think I did well in the class. But I remember, I think I got an A on that paper at least, you know, for a <laughs> presentation was fun. Everybody likes hearing about sports. And so yeah, it, I think I did at least pretty well on it. That's awesome. So when you were in college, um, you know, pitchers, they, they keep charts sometimes, uh, especially in high school when, when they're not pitching and whatnot for us. Did you ever start kind of start and compile some of the data, some of the ideas during that time? Yeah, a little bit. You know, it's funny. Like I, I was at I was at Vanderbilt before they were any good. I, my my baseball reputation has massively improved since Tim Corbin. I was right before Corbin. <laughs> I kind of joke. I was like, if we hadn't sucked so bad, they could have never gotten Tim. Yeah, they wouldn't have fired <laughs> him there. So, um, but yeah, you know, it's funny as you know, it's funny as like I tell people it's funny. So I did not have. I mean, if if I look back growing up, I mean, I I struggled a little bit in some math classes in high school and even in college. Um, and, and, and we, we were not that advanced of a program. I mean, we, certainly as a pitcher, like I said, I, I definitely kept charts. Um, I, I think what I've always found myself being interested in though, and I, even I felt this in college is I'm just, I've always been fascinated even when, as a player by coaches and how they do what they do. Why do they do what they do? Why are we doing this? Why are we doing that? You know, why do you believe this? So I think for me, like my interest in analytics didn't, didn't necessarily start with like stats or numbers. It, it's more about I'm fascinated with decision making mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, and like what, you know, what makes good decisions, what makes bad decisions, why do you do certain things? And I, I think that's at the core of what analytics is. Too many people think of analytics, they think stats. Mm -hmm. I mean, analytics is, is to me, it's about information and empowering that information to make really good decisions. It's not just about stats. I mean, anybody can go collect stats, mm -hmm. and they can have absolutely no influence on what you're doing at all. For me, it's it's that aspect of it, you know, the, the decision making aspect that I'm really interested in. I'm I'm sorry, I'm a little behind, Jared, because I'm taking notes because I told you I'm a <laughs> geek, right? So, let you mentioned it about your brother. Tell us about your team members. Tell us all the guys yeah, that are there. We're four. We're a four man shop, which is kind of pretty fun. It's myself, my brother Andrew Borland, who's a guy I went to college with, one of my best friends, known him for you know twenty plus years now. And then a four partner got in Marty Cuvion. Marty came on board. He came on board about five six years ago. Marty Marty was running this great kind of website that it, for college football stat junkies, everyone was like relying on called collegefootballstats.com and Marty lived in Atlanta so you know I was you know and it just he actually lived right near where Drew lived and we kind of struck up a relationship and realized Marty's one of those so he is just incredibly talented once again on the software the back end side on real and, and he's like kind of our data purity guy I mean he is he makes sure that our data is really clean and that we're getting you know and that's a huge part of analytics mm -hmm. too it's like you're only as good as your information right you know sure. so that's been big. So that's our, that's our team. I mean, we're, we're a four man shop and it, we, we kind of, you know, we, we've thought about adding people at different times, but and we, we have kind of, we'll have interns, all people doing stuff, but we've, you know, we've kind of found that, you know, we all kind of have skill sets that really build on each other. And it's been a great, we've been a great team. You know, you mentioned you, you guys kind of started building this in 2009. When did you kind of decide, you know what, this might work? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. I, it was kind of funny. I mean, looking back, you know, you, I, I think I always thought, I, I think I always thought, like, this can work. I think what, you know, what's funny is I never thought it was truly going to work until we landed the college football playoff deal. Mm -hmm. and, and we actually landed that, you know, pretty early on before we, you know, and I was pretty surprised. And that was all of a sudden I'm like, whoa, we can actually, like, make this thing a real thing and not just kind of a hobby. And we actually may be able to make this thing legit. And it took, I mean, that took several years. I mean, like I said, we, 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 we've gone through multiple iterations. I mean, we first started off, it was like almost a, what, that freemium model, almost like a rival scout, right? So, hey, mm -hmm. we're going to have some free content. If you want the premium content, you, know, you pay us $99 a year. And, and we quickly found out that there's, while the analytic community is definitely like intense about what they do, it's not a giant community. 
certainly not like a recruit. Yeah, there's, I mean, the, every Tom, Dick, and Harry will pay 80 bucks a year to know what recruits on campus. There's mm -hmm. not that many that really want to, you know, know about first down efficiency. <laughs> <It's something different. laughs> I, I mean, do. Yeah. I do. Yeah, yeah, that's, <laughs> you know, there's guys like us out there that want that. But, um, and then we kind of went to like almost a totally, well, let's see if we can't just go a free model and then just, you know, try to drive tons of traffic to the site. You realize quickly, in order to make any real advertising dollars, you have to get millions of people showing up to your site. And we weren't going to get that either. So yeah. then we kind of, throughout this process, we're like, man, what are we doing? We have an incredible database, like with really intense information. And we're like, we need to start, we need to start you know, selling this at a much higher price to a select group of people mm -hmm. and not worry about the average Joe fan. And then that's when we really started. In fact, our very first paid clients were agents that represent. Oh, really? Yeah. A uh, group out of Birmingham um, who were still very close with Vault Sports, who represent a lot of coaches. They, you think about it, those guys, they, they need the information as much as anybody, right? They're trying to mm -hmm. go in and represent a coach. You know, they want to be able to point out why this coach deserves, you know, four million a year, why this guy should get hired to this job. So those were our very first real deal clients were were them and then that kind of helped springboard us into you know they've also been great as far as introductions to coaches as well so um it's been it's been a fun little ride it really has you know you mentioned your the work with the college football playoff selection committee and you guys were the exclusive platform uh for them what what were they kind of looking for if you can tell us yeah you know it's funny you know that we got that 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 full relationship started on twitter that's how we literally got that. I, Michael Kelly, who's the current AD at South Florida, was at the time the COO of the of the college football you know playoff, and we knew they were going to need information. Right? They kind of said publicly they were going to have to have some level of this wasn't just going to be get the guys in a room, and so we started looking around. We're like, this is going to be interesting because we built this database. We've got this incredible information. The great part about us, too, is there's no bias, right? We're not – I mean, mm. imagine if ESPN was the one providing the platform. <laughs> you know, yeah, right. The bias could be enormous. So, you know, it took us probably six trips, you know, to Dallas, meeting with them back and forth. But, you know, we, we had such a great platform, and I think we were able to be nimble. And I think we were a lean company, so we – you know, we didn't have to go and put some exorbitant number out there that they had to pay in order to, to get us on board. And I think they just they at some point they loved what we were able to put in front of them and create, and and then I think also us not being a huge like you know there's there, we no one's gonna call us out for bias, right? Yeah, I mean we're a small company, right. four man shop, you know we're just creating a great platform, and I think it was um, I think the real genius of what we do is the platforms we create. Because it's one thing to have, we call it our three C's. You've got content, context, and conclusions. Those are kind of the three C's we look at with analytics, right? I mean, at some point, you've got to have good data. But then I've got to be able to bring context to that data. And I've got to be able to draw a conclusion from it. And kind of if you don't have any of the three C's, you kind of fall short. So we are really, really good at building really user-friendly platforms that allow people to interact with data really well. I think that's what they were the most impressed with. That's really awesome. I have a two-part question. First of all, was it a hard decision to let somebody else from the SEC come into your team with you? And was it your is your brother both you both played baseball at Vandy? We played at Georgia Tech. Georgia said, Tech. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So was that was that difficult? Because you got ACC, SEC, and now you're all working in one team. Was that tough to do? <laughs> it worked. We, 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 luckily, like I said, the, the kind of good about um, the good and the bad about being a Vanderbilt fan is like it's it's hard to get too passionate. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. you know, oh man! So, yeah, you know, just there's been enough heartache over the last you know, you know being a Vanderbilt fan. Um, but yeah, no, it was we, we we've worked we've worked very well with each other. It's been good. Very good. You do have a lot of platforms, and just going through your website and checking things out. There is stuff for everybody. I mean, no matter no matter what part of analytics really interests you, there's something you can sink your teeth into and just get really excited about. You mentioned the head coaching search 
platform on there and how you can help people. When we were off air, we were, we were talking a little bit about that, but I was astonished by one of the facts that you told us. If you could just tell us about that part of your platform and what you guys do for the college football community that way. Yeah. So it's funny. Cause like that was really, you know, when I put together the business plan, that was the, what I wanted to do. Right. I wanted to help with ADs with coaching searches. And it really it was what we, it was kind of the last thing we actually got into doing. And the last seven years we've gotten involved in 45 head coaching searches. And basically what we're trying to do is, you know, sorry, bring a, bring a level <laughs> of diligence to the process as far as, okay, you take an athletic director, you know, what all are you looking at when you go hire a coach? I mean, at some point, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that personality doesn't matter or, you know, character integrity, all that stuff matters. However, you got to make sure a guy can coach, right? And mm -hmm. at some point, kind of the Bill Parcells line, at some point, your numbers are, say who you are at some point, right? I mean, you're either having an impact or you're not. Um, one of my favorite coaching lines ever was Anson Dorrance, who's the legendary women's soccer coach at UNC. You know, he, he always said coaching isn't about knowing the game, right? A lot of guys know the game. He said it's about getting players to do what you want them to do. It's about having an impact, right? And so that's what you look at, like when you look at coaching. So that's what we try to look for. We, we kind of have a four-dimension approach we look at when we evaluate coaches and we kind of put together these risk profiles on coaches and the four dimensions, we think of these are the kind of primary ways that you compete. So you got the player dimension, right? Which is some point recruiting. So at some point, if I can just get better players, mm -hmm. that's a way I can create an advantage, right? I don't necessarily right. have to be an elite coach. If I can get better players, if my players are bigger, stronger, faster than your guys, like I've got an advantage showing up at the field. We look at the player development area, right? Okay, well, if I maybe I don't have as good of players, or maybe my players are equal, but am I developing them better? And then there's ways that we can see that play out on the field, right? So we can we can look at certain guys, and we kind of have like a talent wins and losses type thing. So you know who's taking maybe two, three star players, but then turning those guys into NFL prospects, turning those guys into all you know, all conference players, all American players, and the different things we can look at. We look at scheme, right? I mean, one of the ways you can get advantage is out scheme people. You know, just so we look at different ways impact on that. Then we look at, you know, culture. Culture is the hardest one to find hard data points for. But what we've always, we always think culture shows up in consistency, right? You know, I mean, at some point, if Very you've true. got a really good culture, it does show up. It'll start showing up with consistency. A lot of good – we always say, you know, bad coaches have good years and good coaches have bad years. The question is, do you know which one you have, right? <laughs> right, right. And that's, that's the hard part, right? You know, a guy, guy pops a great year. Okay, well, let's look at his actual numbers and let's and look at that. So, I think what we've been able to do on the coach search side is just say, hey, like, let's – you know, don't buy a company without looking at its balance sheet, right? Right. Like – I'm not going to go buy a company and say, you know what? I just love their products. You mm -hmm. know, but I'm not going to look at their balance sheet. And so we, that's what we, that's what we want to try to help do is look at the balance sheet. Sorry guys. Robert, that's I, okay. Sorry. Right, we don't care. <laughs> so, you know, that's what, that's what we've been able to do on that front. And we found it's these ADs love it. I mean, because, you know, most of what they have access to without us is like, I call it media guide data. You know, it's like it, it'll kind of highlight just real kind of low level, I call it cheap data, you know, stuff you could just go and pull up a media guide and you know, pop out a few things. And we, mm -hmm. we want to make sure that when you're going to hire a guy and pay him four, five, six, eight, ten million dollars, right? You know, you got to go deeper than that. Oh, absolutely. Do you think that phenomenon with what you're doing at the college level, maybe it already has, but how much do you think and do you think it's just going to trickle all the way down to high school? Yeah, you know, I think so too. I mean, at some point, right. I mean, that's the case with hiring anybody. I mean, it's like you, you want to make the process, you, you got to do your due diligence. And part of doing that is going through information. I mean, at some point, the great part about sports is, 
is that it, it we, we record things, right? You know, we, there's, there's a winner and a loser and there's performance metrics you can look at. So we don't have to, you know, there's no reason to guess. And I, it drives me crazy because there's still so many at every level. And it's, it still drives us crazy at the college level. There's so many biases that still drive, you know, the, the hiring process, you know, personality, you know, just connections and just the political side of it. And it still drives it and it drives me crazy. I always say, you know, if you look at how symphonies, um, how, how they pick who, they're, who plays in a symphony, when they show up to, um, to audition, they're behind a screen. So, mm-hmm. so I, I, I have no idea if it's a fat person, a skinny person, a female, a male, black, right. white, whatever. Yeah. Now, the music, mm-hmm. right? I want to, can you play? I don't right. care what you look like. Can you play? And at some point with coaches, is can you coach, right? Are you having an impact? What do the numbers show about you? At some point, I've learned this. I've studied coaches so much. They come in all shapes and sizes. They're, they're, they're not, there's no like, I'll be like, there's a common trait. There's really not. If, you did, if we sat here and we came up with a list of the top 10 college football coaches, I guarantee you they're all night and day different. Their backgrounds are different. Their personalities are mm-hmm. different. The beliefs are different. The way they coach is different. It's all different. But what's not different is they have an effect. There's a great book, um, Marcus Buckingham. He's kind of a, a, a you know, leadership writer. He's got a great book out called The Nine Lies of Work. And he said, and I found this fascinating. He said, one of the lies is that leadership is a thing. And what he means by that, he doesn't mean there's not leaders. He, this, this false idea that I'm going to like read a book or I'm going to train you and all of a sudden you're going to all of a sudden be a great leader. So he said, there's no such thing as leadership. There's only followership, <laughs> right? It's like, if you, you know right. someone's a good leader, if they're actually being followed <laughs> right. and, and followed willingly and in a direction that matters with meaningful results. And that's what I look at with coaches. I'm like, look, don't make it about, make it about that, right? Make it about the music, make it about followership. And then that's where we're hoping we're having an impact there. And believe me, there's plenty of searches where I look up and like, oh my gosh, they didn't listen to the thing we said. <laughs> and then there's somewhere, and, and it's not a, it's not a science, right? I mean, it's still an art. I mean, there's, there's not like, I'm not going to scientifically tell you, I mean, there's certainly guys we've looked at that have not been successful and you thought would be more and, and, and vice versa. But it's just about having a good process, right? Just go about trying to make the best decisions you can and mm-hmm. make sure you have the best information. I think one thing you just said made a lot of sense, which is there is no reason to guess anymore because the, the amount of stuff that's out there that can assist you to do anything, it, it's a vast array of items, you know? Right. And if, uh, if you were a coach or if you were an AD, or you're somebody that's just looking to get started with analytics, where do you recommend you even start with it? Well, that, that's the hard part, right? Is cause like, it's, I think that's the thing is that people get intimidated to like, you'd be amazed. Like I'll go, I was at a, I was at a convention here three, probably two, three months ago. Now there's a room full of coaches or some NFL guys, high school and college coaches in there. And you know, there's probably 20, 30 guys in a room. And I said, I said, hey, raise your hand if you think you're analytical. Not a single hand went up in the room. Huh. And I think it's partly because they don't even really know what that means. And I think, or if they do, they think it means like you've got to have a PhD in statistics, right? Or you've got to have some advanced math training. A lot of these guys are, you know, former players and stuff. So and that's a great question, Yara. I think, I think, I think a lot of that's a great question because. Yeah, you know, when I look back, we didn't really – the one reason we created what we created because there wasn't a lot out there. You know, like, yeah, you can go to ESPN. You can go to different things. You can kind of look up some numbers. But it's hard to know where to start. And, I mean, that's a good question. I mean, it's like I, – I think, like, I've talked to high school coaches, too, and I said, start with your own – with what – with what in, in your own house. Meaning, like, go ahead and start tracking your own stuff to start. You know, like, okay, what do we care about? Mm-hmm. right okay well if we care about this then let's find a way to kind of measure it right and then once we measure it then we can really manage it better so i think start it it just started real high level questioning of 
why do we do what we do and how can we measure that, right? There's a, I call it the, um, the Abraham Lincoln. Uh, there's a great book, um, I'm blanking the author's name now, but he, it's, he's, it's a book about Lincoln and Churchill and their kind of leadership styles. And this guy said one Lincoln's real, he had a kind of three part leadership style and it was, it was, the first part was you have to vigorously measure success and failure, hmm. right? Okay, so what is success? What is failure? Number two, find the causes of success. Number three, eliminate the causes of failure. It's, it's one of the greatest management systems that I've ever seen. It's the simplest thing ever, but right? It's like, okay, first and foremost, I got to measure it. You know, then I got to see, okay, like where are we succeeding and where are we failing? So let's do more of the stuff that causes success and less of the stuff that causes failure. Like that's analytics in yep. a nutshell. And that's what it is. 100% agree. JR and I talk about this a lot. What is the definition of that word? Whatever it, is, whatever yeah. it may be. If I don't care if you're defining how you block. I don't care if you're defining analytics. I don't care if you're defining success or failure. Just define it so we all understand because – I think you're completely right. I think people look at analytics and they're like, well, that's some, that's some computer stuff and they do that. I don't need that. I'm just playing so-and-so who I've played for the last five years and we've won by 20 every year. And guess what? That next Friday night or Saturday, you get beat by 20. That's right. It's because that guy learned how to define what success and failure was and how to figure out, like you said, how do we get more of this column and a whole lot less of this column? And that's what yeah, you guys are doing. We get, we get on uh, autopilot. I've got to be real close with Michael Lombardi. I don't know if you guys are familiar. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I, he's, I've learned – I mean, we talk all the time, and he, he's been fortunate to – and he told me this probably a year ago. And at first I was like, what are you talking about? And then it's like – and now I'm starting to see it. He said – he said – he's talking about NFL coaches. He said most coaches don't know why they win or lose. I mean, he said they, they, they really don't. I'm like, what do you mean? Like, I, I yeah. don't know. Like, like, what do you even mean by that? He's like, they don't understand why they win or lose. They really don't. And he goes, and he goes, he, and he goes, he goes, start asking. He goes, ask some of your clients on Sunday, Monday, say, hey, why did y'all win or lose the game? So I started to do it. And I was like, holy crap, he's right. I was like, most of these guys, like the answers were horrible. They didn't really, yeah. or it was so very well. Yeah, you know, well, we didn't turn the ball over. Well, I was like, okay, but like, well, why? Like, did you get lucky or like, what, what, or we executed? What is that? We didn't execute. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. I think his point was, like he said, <laughs> the genius of Belichick is he truly understands exactly why they win or lose. And that's the reason he doesn't lose that much. <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah, right, right. He knows right. what's going to really matter in a game. And most coaches, most coaches prepare – for they prepare to play they don't prepare enough to like under truly understand okay here's why we're going to win or lose this game and going into it know that and then if you if you know that going in then then you can obviously do a better job of making sure you don't lose right mm -hmm. is if i truly know why we're going to lose and i can make decisions to limit that then i've got a much better chance to win and he's, it is fascinating. There's a lot of guys, the reason you know he's true is because a lot of guys, they, they commit the same mistake over and over and over again. You're like, okay, well, obviously you don't know why you lose. You, keep <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah. You know, in Lombardi's books, you know, the one he wrote, Gridiron Genius, that's fantastic. We're talking right. about, uh, you know, I think it was like a master class in building championships and, okay. and dynasties and whatnot. And, some of the analysis that he gives in there, you just really don't think about that uh, on a normal day-to-day -day basis. You really got to read the book to yeah. to understand kind of what he's what he's really talking about there. So I'm going to ask you a couple specific questions about some of the things you guys do. I was looking at your uh, reporting dashboards, and yeah. I kind of noticed you. It said on there it will replace the reports, the kind of XOS DV Sport you know, and what not to use. And at the high school level, I think everybody uses a uh, huddle, you yeah. know, which to me, that's just a, a conglomeration of data that won't tell you anything because they don't know how to, how to do reports. Uh, 
where do you guys kind of go with that with that part of it with your dashboard yeah, you know, part of it, like i said i think was kind of going back to the creating you know when we first started working with coaching staffs we we go into these meetings and they'd they'd have these game books that they'd put together for each week i mean they looked i mean they're like they're the thickest things i've ever seen in my life and I'm like, <laughs> we'd ask these guys i'm like how much of this do y'all really read and they were being honest they'd say very little yeah, the, it was almost like, well, why are you doing this? So, you know, and one thing we really pride ourselves on is like, when you get with coaches, it's like, look, you don't need a hundred pages. What are the five in here that actually matter in a given Amen. week? Amen. Yeah. Amen. Forget the hundred. I mean, it's like, and people think that's what analysis. Well, look at this thick book. Like, I don't, I don't give a crap about the hundred pages. There's only three in there that are going to make any real difference. You know, we've always said data can actually be a liability. Um, you know, if, if you, if you're spending a lot of time, energy, effort, collecting something and you're taking away from other things, then you're not doing anything with it. Then I, I said, there's a lot of it that you don't need to be doing. Mm-hmm. And we see that a lot, you know, like I, I've had coaches and they'll show me a report and I'm like, well, what do you do with this? And they'll, they want to have a good answer. It's almost like it's just become a part of their habit, right? Why does this what I look at? Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, how do you look at this? Right? right. Like, how's this making you better? Does this matter to winning and losing? And the answer is no, then, then stop, stop it. You know, like you don't have, it's almost like there's a sense in the football world of like more is better, right? right there's just like, right. well, I gotta have more. I gotta, if I spend 30 more hours watching film and I, you know, I put together 30 more reports then I'm that much better off. I'm like, well, not necessarily. You know I mean? It's, it's, it's a matter of distilling, like Lombardi and I talked a lot about this too. It's about being an information broker. So we talk about you like the the Cleveland Browns, for example, they've got a huge analytics department, but they suck, right? Because like they don't have someone at the top and they've not had head coaches that were information brokers. Bill Belichick is a genius information broker. Mm -hmm. He's like, like his job is to take all this information and distill it in ways that people can use it and, and, and profit from it and profit from it with victories. And I think that's where that's where I think we see like the need for a head coach. You have to be that information broker. You got to make sure you're knowing when to give it out, why to give it out, how to give it out, what to look at, what not to look at. And I think there's not enough coaches that do that. They think analytics just means like hiring people to put together reports. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden we're analytical. It's like, no, you're not. <laughs> you just put a lot more paper. You know, like you're, you just, you're not, you're not, you're not any more analytical. You just, you hired a bunch of guys to get print off reports. I mean, I was with a, we were with a SEC defensive coordinator last all season and we passed by this room and there was like 10 guys huddled in there. And I was like, who are all those guys? Because I had a bunch of analysts. I was like, what do they do? <laughs> <laughs> what are they doing in there? <laughs> He's got, he goes, I don't know. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, I mean, a, a lot of it is, you know, it just, to me, it's about being simple. You got, if you can distill it down to its simplicity of like what matters. And that's, that's the hardest part is asking the right questions. We, we always say, I think the biggest mistake I see in analytics, people start with the tactical instead of the strategy. Like you got to start at a higher level like we'll, like, we'll go to a team, they want to immediately start talking about, like, two-point charts and fourth down. I'm like, no, whoa, 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 hold up. I want to talk about high level. Tell me how your team is designed. Tell me about the offense you run, the defense you run, this, your special teams philosophy, your practice philosophy. I want to hear your overarching strategy. How are you designed to win games? Mm-hmm. Right? And, like, that's a high level. Start there. And then let's start diving in. Let, let, let's let the tactics – be driven from a strategy, not the other way around. And so, you know, like, look, here's the reality is like your fourth down chart. Is not why you win or lose game? It's really not. I mean, the handful of times in a year that in the games, it really makes, it's like, if, you know, it, it's, you know, when 40 plus percent of football is first down and you have a, you have a crappy first down, you know, package or game plan, that's going to more likely be why you lost the game. Not because you didn't go for a fourth and two at midfield. Right. 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 Um, right. that stuff drives me crazy with not starting with the right <laughs> questions on the strategic. You know, and I think you mentioned 
Bill and I talk a lot about, you can have paralysis by analysis. There's got to be a, a spot to where it has to stop. You know, and you mentioned you got to figure out exactly what is important. So if somebody was trying to decide that, what would you say would be the top three things where they could start? Yeah, you're talking about like you're trying to figure out what's important? Yeah, like in a, yeah. within a scouting report realm or, or anything. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, um, you know, like I said, I think a lot of it is, you know, spend time looking at, you know, for, I think, first of all, start with a little bit of intuition, right? I mean, sometimes it, it, we, we act like our guts can be very good. You know, a gut instinct can be good. So, I mean, I think part of it is, you know, I always start off with a kid and say, what does it matter? I'll say, what do you think matters? Mm -hmm. and, and you start off with that. Like, okay, is it, well, turnovers. Okay, well, let, let's look at that. You know, well, we're red zone. Okay, let's look at that. You know, and start looking at it. And then you know, that's where we're able to then go in and, like, look through different platforms and start saying, okay, Okay, how much do you know? I, one of the best ways we do it is almost every coach has game goals, right? Yeah. But we always I always want to start off with tell me your game goals, and that'll quickly tell you what coaches think matters. Or it, most times, a lot of them are just well, this is what the previous coach before me had, had done, and or a guy that I used to coach with did these. Okay, well, let's really look at those and let's start digging in. So a lot of times we start there with guys and start saying, okay, I want to start with what you think matters, and then let's look at what matters. And a good example of that was we were working with an SEC offense coordinator a couple of years ago, and he kind of was going through his game goals. And one of his game goals was about red zone, touchdown you know, percent in the red zone. So I think he, he had a goal of like 78%. So I'm like, okay, well, let's, let's, let's start off. Okay, one, is that a realistic goal, right? So like, once again, let, let's get to the context. And we quickly right. found out that was not going to be realistic. I said, <laughs> and, then, and then the second part was, okay, let's now also look at your goal. I think it was like 75, 78% touchdown. I said, okay, coach, I'm going to give you a hypothetical. Let's, let's go to the end of the year. And I say, coach, congratulations. You guys scored touchdowns 90% of your trips to the red zone. And you averaged two trips per game. <laughs> are, are, you, are you happy? Not going to work. Well, okay, well then, once again, you got a crappy goal mm -hmm. because, like red zone, red zone, red zone efficiency matters, but only in conjunction with trips to the red zone. Like if we look at trips to the red zone is more important than red zone efficiency. If I can, right. I mean, if you win the trips to the red zone battle, meaning I get to the red zone more often than my opponent, forget what happens here at the college level. You win nearly eighty percent of the time. Just trips, mm. right? At some point. Wow. I mean, it's, it's almost 80% of the last uh, five years. Just win the trips battle. Just get there more often. So that's just a way of looking at, like, a very simple approach of, like, okay, now th that does matter. Because, like, instead of just blindly looking at an efficiency, because, you know, I, we could get beat 52 to 7, and the one trip to the red zone we got, we scored a touchdown. And I met a game goal. Well, that's a crappy game goal. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like – if yeah. I can, one thing you'll look at, which is great, we have we have, we create these cool uh, goal dashboards for coaches, and I'll I, and we took a trip to I I, I was visiting, and they had their game goal board up there. It was for the previous season, so you could see the result. And I said, "Are y'all seeing the same problem I am?" They're like, "What do you mean?" I was like, "Well, I'm seeing a lot of games where y'all achieved a large portion of your goals and you lost." Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Like those get new goals, right? You know, like, <laughs> right, you know, right. Those are like goals. So I think it's like anything else. And the reality is too, it's like, it's, there's no, there's no magic bullet. Anybody looking for a magic bullet, there's not one, especially with football. High school is massively different than college. College is massively different than the pros. Even when the college, the SEC is massively different than the big 12, which is vastly different than the Mac and the Sun Belt. So, you know, it, it really depends on, on what you're looking at. And once again, that's why there's not some magic formula. It's about just, Asking the right questions, gathering good enough data. I mean, it goes back to Lincoln, right? You know, I want to be able to measure it. I want to then be able to find the reasons why I'm doing good or bad. And I want to be able to do more of good, less of bad. bad. Yep. Should win be on the on the game goals? That's right, right? Win, right? I mean, number one. Win, yeah, number one. Let's win. <laughs> At some point, you know, how you do that, I mean, in the end of the day, it, it matters. To, you know, if you want to consistently win, you need to know why you do it. But at the end of the day, Get a W.
right? Yeah. Oh, hundred percent, hundred percent. So in business, we, we have this little saying that fits exactly what you're saying. Revenue is vanity, profit is sanity, and cash is king. That's great. I love you, that. You can have as much revenue as you want. If right. it makes you look good, okay, great. You know, you, you can, your profit, that, that keeps, keeps exactly. you going. That's right. But at the end of the day, it's the cash in your hand That's that tells right. you who you are, right? You're like real estate, so I still do a lot of commercial real estate stuff, and we call it cash and fists. That's the only thing I care about in real estate is like when, when all said and done, after I get my rent and I pay all my bills, what, what, and I pay my mortgage, what is my cash in my fist? Right? <laughs> That's right. That's Absolutely. That's what I'm going to care about. Absolutely. I, I love the fact that what you guys are doing is taking the same thing that you do for the team at the school or the business or whatever you're saying, okay, here's our vision. Yeah. This is our mission statement. And then you have to have goals that clearly define and tell you how you're going to achieve that mission and that vision. That's right. But so often, like JR and I have been called cheaters. We have a very good friend, but he's called us a cheater because we use analytics, right? Uh, but if we're using analytics and we're stopping you and you can't run the ball for more than two yards because of our analytics, then we win the football game. That's right. You know, so I think it's, it's kind of like the Rubik's Cube. Everything, everybody thinks it would be really cool to solve it. But once you start, people just want to move the stickers around because they don't want to take the time to learn it, right? That's right. Yeah. It's like, look, we would all said none, you know, most people want to just do, I mean, there it's, you know, there's a conventional path to failure that people love to follow. It's like, mm -hmm. they, they don't like to think differently. I mean, that's, that's all I had to like, feel like, say, I always ask people like money ball, like all money ball, money balls, value investing. That's uh -huh. all it it, it's just, it's not, it's not was well, like, Oh, well, that means you don't bunt or no, no, no. It was basically, we don't have a ton of money. How can we still, win games mm -hmm. right. okay well let's start looking at well you know what you know the only way to really score runs is to get on base and do this and you know, just start just start asking the questions right okay well then wow then they found things that weren't being valued properly that they could they, they could capitalize on that's that's what all that is all money ball is 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 value investing i mean it's it's finding hidden value and finding what matters it's finding little edges that your opponents don't have and, and that's the same thing with analytics. I and mean, that's what you guys are looking for. When you're preparing for a team, you want to be able to go in there with a little bit more information. Mm -hmm. Now, look back, I think, I think my, when I really trace my, my, my greatest coach I ever played for was my high school basketball coach, a guy named Ron Bell. He's in the Georgia Hall of Fame. And I didn't, you know, you don't realize at the time, we were so shockingly prepared for games. <laughs> we had literally 30 page scouting reports for virtually every game we played high school we were all white catholic school my freshman year we went 32 and 0 and won the state championship in georgia oh my gosh and and yeah and and we had one guy on that team that went and played any kind of real basketball in college and we would go into games and i always tell people I'll say if you want to motivate the single best way to motivate is with through preparation hmm. because we go into games we knew exactly what they were going to do we knew where all the strength and weaknesses of their players. We knew their tendencies, and and it took away anxiety. They, right. they all of a sudden we knew exactly how they were going to try to beat us. We knew exactly what we couldn't can do, and all of a sudden we were the most confident team in the world through that. They, that that's analytics, right? I mean, that's what that information that he gave us prepared us to win games. And I think that's really, if I look back at it, that's probably one of the most powerful things that I had done was I had a coach at such early age that like a stage that did that. Yeah. I played for yeah. four years and I saw that and I was like, we, there's games. I'm like, we have no business winning this game. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Like, and we'd win, you know, yeah. like, oh, wow. you know, it's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. It's, it's awesome. Cause you take that, you take that team that might be a team of fives or six out of a scale of one to 10. And because you prepared them, they're playing like they're eights or nines. That's right. I mean, that, that's yeah. really what they're doing. And JR and I love this portion of it. it. We've actually been talking about this through text. Like once you said yes to come on the podcast, I was like, JR, you're never going to believe who said yes. This, this is, <laughs> this is going to be totally awesome. And this is not disappointing. I found one section of your website really, really interesting and don't do it at the high school level, but I should referee profiling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we've been 
I mean, once again, like anything else, I mean, you know, yeah, there's, they've got tendencies there. And there's, there's some of our clients who get a lot of really good data out of that. And there are certain crews that, you know, are going to call certain penalties at higher rates. And, and they may call a lot more offensive than defensive penalties. And even, you know, parsing out by quarter, you know, by home and away, you know, trying to see is there a, is there a, is there a bias that comes into place when a guy, you know, crews at, at you know, the home field or so away game. Mm. And, you know, like, like anything else, I mean, you've got to be careful. Like, you sometimes – Sometimes what you find interesting is that there's not that much interesting in it, right? You know, but that can be yeah. interesting in itself. <laughs> right, and yeah. So in other words, you're like, oh, wow. You know, and, and this is, you know, we, we see this guy, you know, calling a lot more holding penalties here compared to other crews or this or that. And that's that little thing. Once again, it's just looking for that small edge, you know, when you, when you look at that. And that's what a lot of these, you know, these coaches are trying to do. You want any edge you can get. And, and like I said, at certain places – that becomes more important than others. Like I had, the, I had the opportunity to go spend about two hours with Bill Snyder. In wow. Manhattan, and he's been one of my coaching heroes for a long, long Very time. Very cool. Yeah. And it was fascinating to see and talk about, I mean, nothing he did not have his, he, there was nothing he wasn't interested in. Hmm. I mean, he wanted every ounce of information that could, anybody could ever have. He, he wanted it. And he was a great information broker. I mean, he knew then how to take that and then and then dive into it. It was a fascinating, you know, deep dive with him. It's amazing to me the amount of data that you guys not only input but also output. You know, yeah. to give people an idea of of whatever they are interested in, exactly what is going on. When you guys were starting this process, what was the first category you decided we're going to focus on this right now and get this right? So, so the, you know, one thing too is like the great part of what we have to do is, is like we have to be really good listeners. So almost every single platform we built has come from straight from a coach saying, hey, you know what? You know, it'd be really cool. That like there's almost the conversation. Like one of my favorite early tools we built was came from Tom Herman. He was at oh. Ohio State at the time and as an OC. And, and he said – He's like, man, you know what? I'd really love like a he's, – he's like, I'm envisioning like a sushi menu except <laughs> like stats like that can happen in a game. And I want to be able to go like check box different ones and then show me, okay, when these three th things happen, when these two things, when these five things happen, what's the impact on winning? So, <laughs> all right, let's, let's build it. And so yeah. we, then we go and, and then we go build it, right? And so – Almost every – who was it? Rich Skrosky, who's now the the, the uh, OC at FIU. He was at Ball State at the time. And he kind of had this idea of like, hey, I want to really see what impact drives the most. Like when we get a big rushing play, when we get a sack, when we get a penalty, like what's the real impact? How often do we then score points, score touchdowns? Like, okay, well, let's build it. So we call that a drive tool. And then it's you – know, then we get, you get the situational stuff. And then we get into – different levels. So almost every bit of it came from coaches. It's just having good old, like conversations like this, sitting around the table and saying, you know, it'd be really cool. <laughs> if do this, you know, and, and after almost all of our platforms have come from that kind of stuff. Wow. That's, that's really awesome. I, JR and I have been doing some of this. So what we did is what we consumed for data that we found was important we had kind of our own scouting report for us coaches, right? Yep. But then what we gave to the kids was a very much concise That's one right. page. This is it. This is all I need you to focus on. But we took it to the coaches and said, now listen, that 60 kids who got to go to class, they got to do this, they got to do that. Yeah, you're teaching those class, but at night when they're supposed to be sleeping, this is the information that we're going to go off of. And this is how we're going to look at it. What is that a valuable way to look at it, or should we yeah. flip it around? No, hundred percent, right? Like that's your job as the information broker, right? That mm -hmm. you guys are doing exactly what I'm, what I'm talking about, which is fantastic. At some point, I remember Manny Diaz told me he had a great line, and he, you know he always said he tells coaches he goes, "Guys, never forget, we're only as we're only as smart as our dumbest player." <laughs> and his point was like, at some point, you know, like if, if no matter how smart you are and how many endless hours of film and stuff, if you can't communicate it to your whatever, to your guy that's going to actually matter on the field, then it ain't going to matter a whole lot. 
So I think to your point, that is the way to do it. It's your job as coaches to really dive in and to know some intri intricate details that your team, but then your job then is to say, okay, how can I then present this to my players in a way they can one, digest it in a meaningful amount of time and do something with it. And I think that's where that information brokerage part comes into play. And I right. think that's where, that's a lot of leadership in my mind is that like I've had so many guys that are former guys that have played with the Patriots tell me what's really fascinating about Belichick is people said if they knew how simple some of their game plans are, they'd be like shocked. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sure. Like, yeah. What? That was the game plan. And it's not that it probably was really complicated, but what Bill did was he was able to distill it for them into a really simple way that they could understand it. And like, got it. I can, I can do that. And then, and then, the, so I think that's to me where like real genius lies with the coaching side of it is like, what am I going to share? How am I going to share it? Why am I going to share it? And then what do we still have on our end to kind of you know, you know, implement it the right way? And I think, I think you're doing exactly right. I and mean, I think that's where a good coach does that is I think there was a uh, Tom Coughlin had, a, I think one of his books he wrote, he always used to say, we want to feed our players a steady kind of a steady diet of data, right? Mm -hmm. like, you know, like it was like a steady information, never too much, right? We don't want them to choke on it or puke from it, but we want to, we want to give them a steady diet of information. And I think right. that's what coaches do, right? You know, there ought to be a little bit of information, you know, feed a little bit feed a little bit here, feed a little bit there, get in their head, understand what you want them to, to know is important. And, and then like, and they'll, they'll get that. I think you got to communicate the data to your players. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, JR and I spend a exorbitant amount of time coming up with what we think are offensive goals, right? Like yeah. one of the things that we look at is how good is our drive? If we can get at least half the yards we need on first down. Right. So whether that's first and 10, first and five, first and 15, how good are we at getting a second set of downs if we get half the yardage on first down? And what we found is that if we can get half on first down, our success rate just exponentially goes up yeah. because not only play calling and, and stuff like that, but the kid's mentality of what they can get, right? That's right. And that's like, you know, I was telling you, it's like you have four, over 40% of football is first and 10. Yeah. Like it really is. I mean, it's like, you've got to be like one of the things we look at, there's nothing new under the sun. We call it our Walsh rating. So we look at Bill Walsh said that third down is often an overrated factor in winning and losing. And he said the best third down is the one you don't get to. Right. <laughs> That's so true. If you actually yeah. look at what percent of your first downs are coming on first down, second down and third down. Mm -hmm. And so you want a low percentage of your plays to be, third down. So when we created our Walsh rating, we're like, oh, wow, guess what? You know what the best offenses in college football don't do that much? They avoid third down. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, at some point, you know, it's like, I was like, well, I remember we were talking to a coach and I'm, he's like, we got to get better on third down. So how are you going to do that? Well, we're going to implement some more third down packages. We're going to spend more time in practice. I'm like, coach, your third down problem is that you had one of the highest yards to gain average on third down of any team and you got there too often. Your third down problem is not a third down problem. It's a first and second down problem. And, Absolutely. And so you yeah. understand how are you going to fix the problem? The problem yeah. is not to spend more time in more complicated third down. If you're in third and nine, most teams suck on third and nine. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, yeah. I don't care how much time you spend on it. You're not going to, you know, I mean, you, what you're going to go from 15% conversion to 18. Like, you I mean, like that's, you, you got to get better. So, that's another way of like understanding what matters is like, I need to make sure I'm emphasizing that. I want to emphasize to my offense. We want to avoid third down. We're going to try like, you know, like I've always found it. So the, so the, the most common down and distance in football after first and 10 is second and 10 or longer. 15% mm -hmm. of football. So, but what do most coaches do? They have throw away second long game plans. They run right. happy plays or weak handoffs, you know, because they get to the quote unquote manageable third down. I always challenge you, well, what does manageable mean? Does it mean like when we convert 60% or more, 70% or more, 50% or more, what's manageable, right? So like you have it like the Patriots have a very sophisticated second long game plan. The reason they do is because they know the numbers, it happens a lot. Yeah. You're gonna be second and 12 a lot more than you're gonna be in third and one. 
So, you know, like you just, just, that's just the data, you know, like it just shows it. So, you know, I'm not saying you don't have a good third and one package, but the reality is you probably need to spend more time on your second and 10 offense than you do, you know, than you do your third and two offense. It's amazing to me just listening to you when you, when you bring up stuff like the, the second and long to where people just throw away plays. And then I'm sitting there, I'm going, you know, I never really thought about it that way just because I just don't know the numbers to it. So as you're analyzing teams and you guys are, are obviously doing a lot of things for teams, what do you see as the area that everybody's the most negligent in? Yeah, you know, I, th I think um, I think that is one of them. I think second and long is, is an area. I think there's, I think uh, like there, I think there's not a lot of teams that are intentional about being a good second and long team. You know, and I think even for, I don't think there's not a, there's not enough emphasis on first down. You know, on on first down offense. I mean, when you and the re the way you know something is how what what do you practice, right? Like, where, what are you spending time practicing on? Um, you know, and so I think another area that gets neglected is is um, uh, P and ten efficiency. So Manny Diaz turned us on to this too. This was probably three, four, five years ago. He we were I was at dinner with him here in Nashville. He's recruiting, and um, he said, "Hey, I'm just convinced." that P and 10 efficiency is like really, really vital to whether or not a team is going to score points on drives. I said, really? Huh. And he gotten this from Todd Graham. He said, he, and so this was, you know, and so we said, okay, well, let's look at it. So we looked at it and like, oh my gosh, like this is like huge. You know, we were seeing where a team would literally, there'd be a 30, 40% swing in their ability of scoring just on the, what happened on the first play of the drive. It, it, it just whether or not you were efficient on that very first play of a drive. And we're like, whoa, like we, we, we call it the first. So P and 10, first play of a drive, first down, um, first quarter. It is amazing how many college games are done at the end of, like it, when you're leading after the first quarter, you've got over a 70% chance of winning the game. Look at the first oh, half. Whoa. You look at the first half. It becomes even bigger. We look scoring first is amazing. So a lot of people like Lombardi told me this too because he's he's had the unique ability. He worked for Walsh, Al Davis, mm -hmm. and all, no one's only guy in football. I think you've done that. And he said people misunderstood Wall. The reason Walsh was the guy that scripted. I mean, part of it was a comfort level and just taking away some of the guessing. But he said Walsh was obsessed with scoring first. Mm. Because he knew mm -hmm. how important it was. He said, especially on the road. Huh. Like, you, like, and so we started looking at that day and we're like, oh my gosh, like it is shocking, you know, how often, like how, how important scoring first is. You know, like emphasis on stuff like that. Like I always joke, you know, everybody, the, the old cliche, you know, everybody holds the four fingers up and the fourth quarter starts. And somebody said, you know, said, you know, the best way to be a good fourth quarter team is have a lead going into it. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And the reality is, like, fourth quarter comebacks are actually pretty rare, at least in college world. Like, yeah. I always joke, it's easy to come out with a one finger up when they leave mm -hmm. in the fourth quarter. Like, we need to be a great first quarter team, a first half team. Um, yeah. Another area we've seen really huge is the middle eight, which is those last four minutes. Yeah. yeah. So those are, gosh, it's been amazing. You can totally flip games that way. And if you look at, like, yeah. I mean, there's almost no team that's a great middle eight team that's not a great team. Um, there's so many examples of that, you know, and there's so many ways to do that. So, you know, once again, I think there's so many different areas on just stopping for a second and understanding why you're looking at what you're doing and why, you know, and mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest thing. And I mean, the only real benefit right now to what we're seeing is I think this is a great opportunity for coaches during this time when everybody's got a whole lot of free time on your hands, start asking great questions. Like, you know, this is the time when you can do that. Like sit down and start questioning everything you ever did. I think Pete Limbo, I think it was Pete Limbo told me um, one time, he said he always, he said every single year, pretend like you were just hired to the job you have. Mm -hmm. Like, cause whenever you go to a new job, you start questioning, okay, why are we doing this? Uh -huh. why are we, like, but do that. Even if it's, you've had the job 20 years, still right. treat you like that. Like you just got right. this, okay, I'm going to look around with new eyes and see what do we need to be doing differently. You know, you've mentioned Belichick several times, and we mentioned on a previous podcast episode that his dad's book, The Football Scouting Methods, is unbelievable. So yeah. 
Here's a question for you. Have, has anybody ever asked you to track inherited versus made first downs? You know, I don't think so. No, I don't see that. I don't think they have. Uh, well, hopefully none of our opponents are listening to this. But yeah, it, we do that all the time. It is so. amazing the statistical difference between teams and what they do on an inherited, inherited first down, which is something they get – you know, with a, with a punt or, a, or after a kickoff or whatever versus a made first down, which is one they make during the drive. Like, we have annihilated some teams mm -hmm. just with that data alone. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, yeah never had that question. Interesting. No. Okay. That's, yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah. We um, we've totally believe what you're talking about with scoring first. And the school that where we were on the defensive side of the ball and dabbled in the O a little bit before we're – where we're at now, we had a streak of, you know, we put together our top six plays. It was how we think we can beat you right now to score. And I think for like three years out of uh, the top six, I think there was only one drive we didn't score on yeah. in our first drive. And lo and behold, in three years, we only lost three football games. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So <laughs> It, it totally makes a difference. And I think what you're saying is so much up JR's alley and mine with eliminate all these goals that really to us mean very, very little because yeah. we, we look at it in a different way. Like if you say, Hey, I don't want, I don't want 15 yards and penalties. Okay. Why? I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we're dealing with kids. How many games in high school or college are played with no penalties? Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. Penalties. Interestingly, penalties. If you look at it from a pure correlate, because that's really too is coaches. Don't get wrong. I mean, I'm not saying penalties don't matter, but they don't matter nearly as much as some coaches emphasize them. And 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 just from a date from a correlation standpoint, there's on the there's literally zero correlation between penalties and winning and losing. In fact, some really. Of the, well, yeah, literally zero. It's it's amazing. Huh. Yeah, and, and part if anything, and I have, to, I have to relook at it. There could even be some of the best teams actually are highly penalized teams. Hmm. Um, and then now there's some penalties that hurt worse than others, right? Sure. Like so, there's it, like anything else. It's kind of like with turnovers. I think I, I was because Coach Napier, we were we were talking recently. You know, not all turnovers are created equal. Right. Um, and and you know, no turnover is a good turnover. However. You know, if if it's third and 10, third and 15, and, and I, you know, we throw a ball downfield, it's intercepted deep in there. Like, that's different than, you know, I turn the ball over in, in the red zone, you mm -hmm. know, and it's in the fourth quarter. So, it's like anything else. There's, you know, it's, it's understanding, you know, which ones really matter. And not that, I mean, you don't want to, you, you don't want, I mean, no, I ever wants to turn the ball over, but the, knowing which ones matter the most and then communicating that. You know, knowing when it's so vital to not lose the football, you know, or so vital to do this. But, you know, just, once again, I mean, it's that idea of just digging, digging deeper and just continuing to ask questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's where people also are negligent sometimes as well. This is the way we always did it. That's right. It's like, well, times change, man. You know, and you need right. to kind of think about things like that. So I'm going to ask you a hypothetical question here. Do you think a computer could make enough correct decisions to win a football game? Yeah, you know, I, 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 I actually, I, I don't, I, I don't. And here's why I'll say that is because I think at some point there's a, there's a, I mean, you have to tell I read a lot. There's a, uh, David Epstein's got a great book out. It's probably a year or so old now. It's called Range. And in it, they talk about there are, you have to understand the limits of analytics in whatever field you're in. So there's, you know, like there's kind and wicked environment. So like, hmm. um, you know, chess is a very kind environment, right? Mm -hmm. There's a reason a computer can beat the greatest chess player world because the rules, like the weather doesn't affect the chessboard. You know, like the, 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 the right. temperature of the room, you know, my, my like the rules are very standard you know exactly what you can do there's a lot mm -hmm. of things in a very kind environments you know i mean i mean a lot there's and there's like you know some sports are pretty baseball is a much kinder environment than football um you know there's yeah. golf is a very kind environment just that football is wicked it's very wicked you've got 22 people on the field you've got all kind of moving parts 
and, and context is everything, right? You know, what happens from one play to the next? There's injuries that you can't plan for. There's, you know, you know how hard a guy gets hit to play before, or, you know, so, you know, the weather changes middle part of the game. You know, just the, the atmosphere, the motivation. There's so many things that go into it. So, I mean, I, I think you have to be very careful with understanding the limits of, like, what the side can do. Um, it can, I'm not saying it can't be very useful. It can't. Yeah. I mean, you can cover things. But, but to answer your question, I think you got to be very careful with, you know, the, there's still some decision-making that you have to have in game, like there's that you're not going to be able to model very well. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, I, I read a lot about uh, Fergus Connolly. I yeah. really like. I've, I've got to be buds with Fergus. He's a great guy. I tell you, it, some of the stuff that he does is – it's unbelievable. And, you know, he's putting out a series here pretty recently that I've been on in the mornings, and he's talking yeah, about invasion good. games and yeah. manipulating space and all this. And when you were kind of talking about some of the stuff you read, it reminded me of a book that I read called The Only Rule Is It Has to Work. Yeah. And it, it was about <laughs> just a couple of baseball guys that were huge into analytics and got involved with an independent league team, I think is out in California. And he said, we're going to do all this shifting and we're going to do all this stuff and it's all going to be based on analytics. And for the most part, it worked out for them. You know, they still had some pitfalls, you know, here and there. But uh, I tend to agree with you. I think a, the computer can help, you know, a yep. lot. We've kind of proved it with, with the stuff we've kind of developed. That it, It's kind of nice having that comfort zone to say, well, what, what does the computer say right now? And then you kind of look at what's going on. Like you said, it isn't a – it's a wicked game. And yeah, the, you know, there's um, Daniel Kahneman's book, um, Thinking Fast and Slow. He talks about a lot – the, the best thing you can do is combine kind of algorithmic type thinking with, you know, also some good human intuition. Yeah. That, that typically is when you get the best results. I mean, you know, that, that computers, like I said, in certain environments, they can do really well, but, but in others, you know, they can't, I mean, interestingly, even just look at our current circumstances, it's a lot of these, you talk about a wicked environment. Imagine trying to predict what a, what a virus is going to do and in, in all the different mm -hmm. around the world. And you see some of these models that has just been massively off. Yeah. And there's a great line by George Box, who, you know, kind of famous line that, you know, all models are false, but some are useful. And so you got to under every model you put together is going to be wrong. It's just, is it useful? And yeah. so, like, actually, you got to ask yourself, like, it's not whether or not this is exactly right. Because any, any app, anything you're modeling, you're making assumptions and you're having to, take into account, it's this, am I actually getting usefulness out of it? And that kind of goes to what you said in that book, like, does it work? Yeah. Like, is it working in a way that's providing me useful information that I'm then able to use to make better decisions? If it's not, then it's not, then, then don't do it. Get rid of it. Right. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's an awesome point because how many times do you get into a game, JR, whether you're, you're dealing with baseball or Steven, you're, you're pitching at Vandy or, you know, we're calling a play on Friday night and you ask the kids what they want. And statistically, it's probably not, it may not be your best play, but it's one that they trust and they know they can get six yards that turns into eight. Or, okay. you know, what, what's the old saying in baseball, never shake off the catcher, right? Don't ever <laughs> shake off the catcher because only yeah. bad things happen. Yeah, he hits uh, the okay. bull. <laughs> yeah, he hits the bull, right? Uh, I'm going to ask a couple more because your time is really valuable and I could sit here and talk for hours. But um, years ago, I went to Vegas and I heard Chip Kelly speak. And this was – he was still still at Oregon. And I remember him starting off his his presentation for the morning at the at the Nike clinic with time of possession is nonsense. It means nothing. I don't care about it, and neither should you, basically. What have you guys found as more and more teams shifted away from the under center wishbone and triple option back in Nebraska to full spread and tossing the ball all around the yard? What have you guys found about time of possession now in yeah, college so football? That, I love the conversation. So, um, I actually disagree with him in, in this sense. Time of possession doesn't matter unless you make it matter. Hmm. And what okay. I mean by that is, like, so great example, I want to go to one of my heroes, Bill Snyder. You go back and look, I think it was 2011 and 12, they had back-to-back 10-11 -back win seasons. 
they were clock eaters. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason is it was designed that way because part of the reason he knew that the only way they could win games is like the other team can't score if they don't have the ball. So he's right. at Kansas State. Yeah. They don't have, they're not, they, I mean, they, they don't have legit defensive players, right? Like they, he's, I mean, they've got to find ways to shorten the game, to keep the possession, to be ultra efficient with their possessions. I mean, like, right, the way, the way Army is designed that way. Um, mm -hmm. I just analyzed Kirk Soroka um, at, um, who's down at Penn State, fast, a huge time possession guy but been ultra efficient on that. So it's not that time possession doesn't nest. Like if you look at it from a pure correlation of statistics, it has very little correlation to winning, but that doesn't mean that you can't make it matter. It's kind of like tempo. Tempo mm -hmm. is only good if it's good, right? Like I mean, it's not inherently a good thing to be a tempo team unless it is good, unless you use it strategically to your advantage. So I think whenever you talk about stuff, like, interestingly, like Mike Leach has actually said very similar things, like, oh, times that's the most useful in the world. And what's fascinating is Leach actually is usually pretty high on time of possession. <laughs> like, like it, it's, it's, it's kind of good. Like, so I do think possessing the ball is, is important. Now, you know, the time of it can be less, but at some point, you know, if I can be ultra efficient and I can keep the ball, I, that can be very, very good for me. But right. like I said, I, if I eat up clock and I don't go score, then mm -hmm. once it goes down to red zone, I have to marry the efficiency with the possession, mm -hmm. like which is what our, our army does. You know, a lot of the triple options do that. It's what Kirk Soroka has done as an OC. It's what Bill Snyder did. Uh, those guys made it matter. Chip Kelly could have cared less, right? He just wanted to be ultra explosive and efficient. He didn't care if they scored in, in one play. Or, or, or took them, you know, 20, and that's fine. But he made that not matter. But I think you can make time possession matter if it's part of your design. Oh, absolutely. I, I do agree with that 100%. One of the things that we, we also try and be unique in, and we see it happening at every level, is the addition of motion on nearly every play. Yeah. What have you guys found with that? So, I, whatever reason, I got really into studying Joe Gibbs in the last, like, year. Fascinated with Gibbs. Yeah. And um, he was – I mean, you go back and watch – so, I've been watching, like, a lot of old Redskins games, like, on YouTube. Nice. He was a master of formations and motions. But it goes back – this is Lombardi's book. He said, Gibbs was a master of old plays, new ways. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, a lot of the ways – to simply just disguise stuff is like throw in some motion, right? Throw in right. like these, you know, change the formation a little bit. So we've seen, I think motion, you, you know, who's the, you know, who's the most heavy motion team in the NFL? Patriots. Hmm. Really? Interesting. Yeah. They use motion. I mean, it, it, even if it's just little motion, right? Like the, they'll, they'll start off with James White split out, then he'll just roll mm -hmm. back in the back. It's just cheap. I call it cheap motion. Yeah. But Motion can be – one, it often forces the defense to declare, right, which is what you're trying to do. They declare things they may not want to declare otherwise. And it just changes some eye level, right? It just it, All of a sudden you get somebody's eyes moving. Mm -hmm. it, it can change your reaction time. It doesn't take a lot. So I'm a huge – I'll see you guys some clips. Like I said, there was – I forget which game. There was one game – I mean, Gibbs, it was like – there was like seven different guys that were <laughs> shifting and motioning on plays. <laughs> It was fantastic seeing I do that. So I'm a big believer in um, find like find easy, cheap ways that don't hinder your ability to execute, but they can kind of make things look a little bit different. Yeah, we do that all the time. And because JR is so good with Excel and stuff, we actually found out that our yardage per play when we motion is double that of when we don't motion. So in, in our mind, we're like, this is a no brainer. You know, if you could turn two into four, well, that's, you know, how many more first downs in a game? Uh, you see, that, like, you guys are such ahead of the curve on a lot of that because so many coaches, like, if you, once again, but the thing about the genius, what you guys are doing, it's just measuring it, right? Like, you just measure it. Mm -hmm. Oh, look, let's do more of this because we're succeeding. It goes back to Abraham Lincoln, right? Nothing new. Right. Let's, let's, like, okay, wow, look, we, we got, we, we're getting double the yardage. It's not like it's hard to add that in, right? It's not like you're having right. like in hours of practice time to do it. Mm -mm. 
it's yeah. just it's cheap gains really that's right it, that's it's right. all it is so i've got one more question for you uh was looking at some of your stuff on coaching profiles so i'm kind of curious about this does it really does it really matter or does kind of like what you were saying if he's got better players he's going to win anyway or what is i guess if you go to a to an ad what's the one one two three thing that they want to know about this coach yeah i mean that's that's a great you know i mean it's i mean the <laughs> The similar answer a lot of other directors, they don't know. <laughs> that, that's what's a little bit scary. You know, they, they don't know. You know, I mean, they'll, you know, they kind of always throw, they always start off kind of throwing off the intangible stuff, which is, you know, off to the stuff that just doesn't matter as much. Um, but it is interesting when you look at like, because we've both asked that, what's the profile of a successful coach? I was like, well, the answer is kind of going back to that Marcus Buckingham thing. It's like, they succeed. Right. I mean, like you say, like, kind of like, there's no, like, I'm not going to be able to say, here's the five characteristics because mm -hmm. you know, like I've heard, like, so what's fascinating, I, I challenge you guys to do this. Ask people, you know, what separates coaches. You'll be shocked at how bad the answers are. Okay. <laughs> yep. that's what You'll be like, what? Oh, well, it's just detailed. Well, I'm like, well, I mean, like, you know, I've had coaches tell me Steve Spurrier was the most undetailed human being on earth. And I mean, literally, they said barely, barely had practices planned in, in all ways. I mean, and one of the greatest coaches ever, you know, I mean, one mm -hmm. of the great coaches in college football history. There's plenty of, there's plenty of detailed oriented coaches that aren't good right now. I'm not saying being detailed is a bad thing. You got to look out for the halo effect. So the halo effect is the idea that when somebody has been successful, we assume everything they do is part of their success, but that's not true. No. There's still things they do that aren't part, right? You can say, well, actually the, the guy that failed did seven of the 10 things he did, but it's trying to figure out the couple that they didn't do. Like, mm -hmm. I think, I think what's massively underrated in coaching is brains. Just, I mean, I mean, seriously, are you actually an intelligent human being? Are you curious? Are you well-read? You look at guys like Bill Walsh. I mean, Bill Walsh used to say his single greatest advantage was that he was primarily coaching against PE teachers. And I don't mean that to be <laughs> I think just like, I mean, all these guys, right? You know, it's just like they're, they're great guys, but, like, these weren't guys. I mean, you look at Bill Walsh. You look at Belichick. You look at guys like Parcells. You look at Joe Gibbs. I mean, look at, look at the success Joe Gibbs has had as a NASCAR guy. Yeah. That guy, there's True. nothing he wouldn't be successful to. Bill Walsh could have run a Fortune 500 company. Bill Belichick could go run. I mean, these guys are really smart, curious people. Mm -hmm. Curiosity is one of the huge things I look for in a coach. Mm -hmm. How curious are they? What, yeah, what it, are they – are they right. are they always looking for edges? Are they all you know? The, if I immediately go in, you find all these old stubborn coaches. You know, I don't need damn analytics. I mean, I mean, okay, <laughs> off any list I'd ever, you know. And I mean, you know, you go back to Chuck Noll. These guys, these are incredibly intelligent people. Now, I've almost never studied a great coach like that. That was it. You look at Wooden. You go back to Wooden to you know. They're all incredibly curious. They're extremely intelligent people. Yeah. And that's been one of the biggest things I've looked at in the traits. Like guys that are just curious, intelligent people that are always looking to find ways to get to gain edges. Oh, absolutely. It's it's that bit it, it that has to be the front of the podcast, JR. It has yeah. to be it has to be the front of it because you're right. So many times we're standing there on a the sideline and we're like, okay. I actually don't have to beat that other coach. What I have to do is make that kid who's practiced all week, give him something that he doesn't know what's going on. And then that coach is like, well, how do I fix this right now? And because you don't have a plan, because you had a 30 page scouting report that you didn't ever really understand a page, you don't know how to fix it. Funny story. We're a few years ago, we're playing and one of the coaches on the other sideline had, he had, kind of ticked us off. I'll put it that way. We'll keep it G rating and kind of ticked us <laughs> off in the pre in the off season. And I told JR, I go, we're going to, we're going to beat these dudes yeah. because that guy was just disrespectful. And one of the greatest feelings I had, I looked up and on the other sideline, JR, I don't know who this is. 
dude is running back and forth down the sideline because he's a D coordinator because he can't figure out what the hell is happening. Yeah. And I'm yeah. like, that's what you get for not being smart at what you're doing. That that's your well, that's, that's great. There's a, my favorite things we've come up with. That this is once this was uh, Parcells. Um, Parcells' his mentor was his high school basketball coach, got him Mickey Corcoran. Mm-hmm. He said Mickey taught him. He said, Bill, there's always a way to win a game. It's your job to figure it out. Mm-hmm. So we say, I always say, I don't want to look for a CEO. I want to, I want a CFO, a chief figure outer. Ultimately, <laughs> your job as a coach is to give your players a plan to win. Like it drives me crazy. Like you'll see a game, and you're like, man, that was the worst game. You didn't give your guys a shot. You didn't give them a shot. You had such a bad game plan. Like, they never had a chance to win that game. Figure it out. Like, and that's the key, right? Am I a figure outer? At some point, you have to go into it a Friday night, a Saturday night, so night. I have to go into that time and say, what are we, what am I doing to help my guys win this game? What Absolutely. kind of game? I think not enough coaches are critical enough on them. Lombardi and I talk about this a lot too. There's not enough rear view mirror in coaching. Me, you once again kind of go into the know why you lost. Hmm. If you had a bad game plan, why did you have a bad game plan? Because if you don't know that, you're likely to have more bad game plans. Do it again, yeah. You had a good one. Well, why did we have a good one this game? Did what? What did we do differently? Why was the game plan good? What went into that? And just spending time on that, like be a chief figure out. Or so many guys just coach to coach. Mm-hmm. That ain't it. Figure it out. Right. If yeah. you can't figure it out. Don't be that. Don't be you know. Don't be a major decision making coach. You know, be a, be a guy that's just you know. Don't be one of the key people on it. When we talk about too, you got to make sure on any given staff, who's driving strategy, who are your mm-hmm. strategists, and who are your tacticians, right? Mm-hmm. And they're different. I could have a guy that's a phenomenal tactician. He may be he may know more about wide receiver, you know, foot placement or hands or catching, and that's phenomenal. But who's driving the strategy, right? right? And, and like you got to understand. And too many times you'll see guys that'll put tacticians in strategic roles and they can't play it. Hmm. That's a good yep. point. That's a great point. I, got, I have a desk full of notes. I don't think you guys could see this, but I got, I got like a desk full of notes here because my whole desk is a, is a whiteboard. So I just write on it like crazy. That's awesome. I have one last question for you yep. before we move off air and, and finish this. Because, JR, we're going to have to separate this into two parts because I don't want everybody to get it all at once. I want them to like <laughs> have to get two parts out of it. Can you still watch and enjoy a college football game knowing all that you know now? Yeah, I will say it's it's it is fascinating. You bring that up. We 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 all four of us joke. I, I it's as it's much as I love doing this. It's definitely robbed some of the like. <laughs> I was like <laughs> you've seen too much of the process and you know too much, mm-hmm. and it definitely changes the way. It definitely has ruined watching football a little bit because. I can't watch it just in that, like, just very simplistic way. I would have watched it before we kind of got into this. So, right. on one hand, it's, it's fun to watch it because you can see a little bit more. The You can you see it differently. You see the strategy. You see the good game plans, the bad game plans. You, you really, like, when a certain play happens and you know how important it is and not other people did, it's kind of fun. But yeah. it definitely kind of robs. There is some innocence they used to have, just be able to kind of have just watching it as a pure fan, you know, like just, mm-hmm. just, it's almost just the irrational. I kind of miss being the irrational fan. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. This has been amazing to me. JR, I know, is going to talk about this for weeks. We're going to get off air and have our post briefing afterwards. And he's he's going to be smiling like this for the next Good couple stuff. of weeks. You, you yeah, just made you guys, his day. I mean, and hey, kudos to you guys too for for doing what you're doing. Um, I think it's, I love I love hearing you know you, your your players probably don't realize it because you know, they obviously are playing for you, not somebody else. But just having coaches that are chief figure outers and giving your kids you know the chance to win because it's fun to win. You know, like it's yeah. just fun. To win. It's fun to win championships. It's fun to win titles. And and when you can as a coach or something so rewarding when you know that you did your job to give them that, right? And, like, you feel like there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's something very rewarding about that and saying, hey, you know, we put this effort in so that you guys can actually have these memories 
that are important and we can figure out there's nothing better especially it sounds like you guys are in a place where you just always roll in with better players i mean how fun is it to beat a team like when you know that you had no business beating them right oh, exactly it's, it's, so it's crazy fun. awesome it's, it's crazy awesome, awesome. It's and crazy it, it's awesome. The kids, too, they'll have those memories forever. You know, like, mm-hmm. they'll remember that time they beat some team they had no business beating. They'll tell their kids and grandkids about those stories. So, you know, that's where part of coaching is, and that's what analytics is, is, like, make really, really good decisions. And, you know, make sure you're not guessing. To your point, JR, we don't have to guess anymore. There's so yeah. much stuff out there, you know, that, that make sure you're digging into it. And you don't have to have, like, he sounds like you guys were pretty sophisticated – but even if you get intimidated, just start off with just – start off with a pen and pad to start track stuff. Then learn – then get more sophisticated. I always look at, too, you know, not enough high school, colleges, et cetera, especially high school. I guarantee you there are so many students that don't play football but would love to help coaches with Excel, with building yeah. data, mm-hmm. with this stuff. So if you don't have this skill – Find somebody that has this skill. Like I don't have coding or databasing skills, but I have really good, what I'm, what I'm really good at, I'm a good question asker and I'm good at figuring out how to like distill information into, into actual items. Mm-hmm. Then I go to my partners that have really incredible skill levels on the technical side with databases. With, hey guys, what about, I mean, I, I literally have stuff where I've just, I've drawn by hand what I, like my vision for a platform. And then I'll, I'll shoot over to Drew and he'll turn into reality. Yeah. So I, part of being a good team is learning how to match skill sets too. Like just because I'm not initially good at something, but okay, why well, don't I, I am good at this. I need to match this up with somebody else. And just like, just like a good team, right? And that's what you got to look for. So too many people don't get intimidated that you can't do analytics. I mean, if, if you have a decent mind and are a curious person, you're probably already doing analytics in your head. Help find somebody that's got computer skills, got Excel skills, that has databasing skills, and and most of the time they're willing to help you. Oh, absolutely! The best definition of the night, Jr. I wrote it down. I'm going to read it right now. Analytics gives you this. It empowers your ability to make good decisions, and I'm going to follow that up with, "Don't your athletes deserve those good decisions?" That's right. For me, Mr. Prather, Jr. Episode 12, it's got to be two parts, Jr. We can't, we can't do it. It has to be two. Break it up. Fantastic. And I'm going to tell people what I'm going to ask him offline, and they're going to have to ask us somewhere on Twitter or something what the answer to it is because we're going to stop the recording and nobody's going to hear it. Okay. okay we're going to hear it. We're going to know because we both want to know. Have you done an analytic search or uh, some kind of formula on the craziness of head coaches – Twitter's accounts, Twitter accounts, <laughs> because Mike Leach would certainly fit in there. <laughs> and the best. and yeah. I think, I think that has to be a layer. Don't answer it. Don't answer it. Cause I know you have <laughs> for <laughs> process, preparation, performance. We're out. <laughs>